What we're doing now is I am going after Dade County in the 2022 election. So this is where Ron DeSantis, one day county, this all Republican, one day county. Okay. Well, for me, I look at deviations, everybody. That's a deviation. Because that was historical. I don't, I, Normally Republicans don't, I don't win that believe, I don't believe it. So I want to, so I'm just going to show everybody, just like we always say about Democrats where they stole their elections, just like they did uh, the one that, that nice lady in Georgia that got zero votes in her own precinct. Right. I want to find out in Dade County what happened there because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a deviation from norm. But what he said about this was everything down to the wording of this makes me think that Mike Lindell is a highly patriotic but extremely vulnerable man being used without his realizing it to discredit real election integrity efforts, which is evil and sad if correct. So just that reveals the game here, right? And and it also shows you, by the way, who is honest and who's not. When you see all of the other right wing media yelling at him, they're basically saying, hey, schmuck, that we don't actually believe that they're cheating, you idiot. We're just using it to smear and tar and feather Democrats. You're not supposed to make up the same charges against the right wing. What do you actually believe these lies? Don't you get it? We're a bunch of pathological liars who lie to support a power grab. And we hate democracy, don't you know any of that? But I, I like that the rest of the right wing is revealing themselves for who they are. Um, in a phone interview with the Daily Beast, he said, the conservative pundits must have ownership in Dominion voting systems. I think they are all probably part owners in Dominion or they hate our country, he concluded. Let's get the important things done first. Uh, but I do love this pillow fight uh, because it, this is when the crazies turn on them, turn on each other, right? So you've got the right wing media saying, hey schmuck, remember we're supposed to lie about Democrats, not Republicans. Then you got Lindell saying, I think all you go to conservative media guys are taking money from Dominion. What is that? That's not true either. You're totally making that up. What's funny is that I have a cold today. So my cold voice sounds weirdly like Mike Lindell's actual voice. Okay. <laughs> oh, they're all making it up, okay? It's, it's the voting rings. The minion paid them all. Okay. So uh, let's strangle the Republican Party in my pillows. Well, you know who's taking advantage of them? The right wing. In fact, TYT broke the story of how the family that puts together uh, the prayer breakfast that uh, idiot Democrats go to and right wing goes to every year. All the politicians go to it. Joe Biden loves it. Uh, that's a very right wing organization. And they hoodwinked Mike Lindell and got him on this road. And they got him to believe that he was going to be a savior that saved American politics for Jesus. And the way he was going to do that was you know, to attack Democrats like this. So that quote's not entirely wrong. He just got the wrong people that manipulated him. It was Christian right wing zealots uh, that he originally manipulated. Um, uh, Mike Lindell in the first place. Uh, go to tyt.com and you'll see that in the under stories. It's an amazing story of how they basically brainwashed him and tricked this poor guy into spending his whole fortune trying to back Donald Trump and on this crazy, crazy path that he went on. So now when Frankenstein turns on you and tries to, you know, does, uh, when pillow talk goes awry. <laughs> <laughs> Stop one more in there. <laughs> yeah, I had to, I had to. Uh, now all of a sudden you're catching feelings Republicans, but you definitely created this monster. I'm Ben Micellis from the Midas Touch Network. This Kimberly Guilfoyle deposition is just devastating and humiliating for her. I mean, so they play that and I am a child of the 80s. And so I like that. And Don's like princess. I think he said princess, you know, show us your dance moves. And I'm a good dancer. This is what Kimberly Guilfoyle is doing on January 6th leading up to the insurrection. And she's talking to the January 6th committee about what a good dancer she is. So we go through other portions of the deposition testimony. She really tries to evade how important it was for her to get paid the approximately $60,000. But the January 6th committee lawyer really kind of drills down on the fact that she was paid this money. Not only was she paid this money, but she specifically asked for this money. And in fact, she said um, no matter what, whether she speaks or not, she wanted to get paid the $60,000 from Turning Point, which is Charlie Kirk's organization, the MAGA extremist who invoked the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination to every question that uh, he was asked. So Donald Trump recently did an interview with Breitbart that was published this past week. And I got to tell you, reading this interview kind of upped the worry factor that I have about Donald Trump in 2024. That's a good talking point. I, I got to give him full credit on that. That's a good talking point. I mean, that's almost something like what you would hear out of, out of at Bernie Sanders. And here it's coming from Donald Trump, right? The guy that can't stop ranting and raving about things that don't exist on Truth Social. That's a poignant argument. And that, again, is why my worry level about him running in 2024 just kind of got amped up a couple of ticks because he goes on. Um, he argued, but he understands that, yeah, Republicans got crushed on the issue of abortion. And a lot of it with the moderates had to do with the fact that many of these bans that were being put in place had no exceptions. Trump is painting himself as a moderate, as a populist. I'm for the working people. They work hard for social security. We're gonna make damn sure they get it. I'm telling you, I had written the guy off. And I think I did it a little too soon. Because when he stops being crazy for a minute, he can be very manipulative. And that's what we have to watch out for. That's what we have to be careful about. It's been a long time since we have seen Donald Trump take off the crazy hat and put on the populist hat. But he did it in this interview. And if he keeps that up, it could be very effective and he could be very tough to beat in 2024. We should really find a way to help incels, those who are involuntarily celibate. And we should do it in a way that does not include forcing women to have sex with them, which has actually been suggested by some. What, David, what on earth are you talking about? So let's back it up. Incel is short for involuntarily celibate. And I believe we need to find a way to help these folks, including to find healthier role models than the people that they often end up worshiping, folks like Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate. Who decides what counts as enhancement and limitation? The usual answer is that it's just personal choice. If Marina decides that her anxieties are limiting her, well, then she can enhance herself. But we know, don't we, that when it comes to tech, things can sometimes technically be a choice, but in reality, compulsory. For example, you don't have to have an internet connection, but good luck applying for a job if you don't. Maybe worth bearing that sort of thing in mind when we're thinking about cognitive enhancements or genetic engineering. Maybe that's where those angry Canadians are coming from.
a lot of people are made uneasy by the idea of transhumanism. And maybe some of that unease comes from the suspicion that tech can be more than it seems. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the technology that changes human beings. We sometimes think that technology is essentially neutral. It can have good or bad effects, and it might be really important who controls it, but a tool, many people like to think, is just a tool. Guns don't kill people, people do. But some philosophers have argued that technology can have values built into it that we may not realize. The classic example is overpasses in New York that were designed in the 1920s by architect Robert Moses. Allegedly, Moses deliberately built the overpasses too low for buses to get under. And since buses were more likely to carry low-income people of color, that meant they couldn't get to the places that white residents wanted to keep segregated. Now that story might not actually be historically accurate, but it contains the germ of an interesting idea. The philosopher Don Ivey says tech can open or close possibilities. It's not just about its function or who controls it. He says technology can provide a framework for action. Assuming for the sake of argument that the Robert Moses story was true, the overpass helps shape society according to the values of its designer. We could take this idea one step further actually and say that technology also provides a framework for different kinds of subjects, people, to exist. Consider something like modern contraception, which allows people reliable control over when they become pregnant. The tech allows you to make a choice. And suddenly the old way of doing things, where women in particular were just expected to be baby factories, becomes one option rather than the way things have to be. In a manner of speaking, we might say that the modern feminist subject who makes choices about her own body is enabled by technology. That's quite a lofty thing to grasp, so here's some more examples. Some writers have talked about how the design of social media can make you behave like an asshole, even if you don't mean to. The philosopher Heather Widows talks about how beauty technology and cosmetic surgery creates pressure to be a different kind of woman now than was possible 50 years ago. And God knows that as the technology of medical transition has developed, it's opened up very different ways of being a transgender subject. Testosterone blockers, for example, are a kind of technology that just wasn't available to trans people 100 years ago, but which make me at least happier, kinder, more intelligent. We might say enhanced compared to what I was before. Unless I miss a dose, and then I wake up feeling like venom. <laughs> Tonight, the story of the talented Mr. Santos continues to unravel. The Nassau County District Attorney has launched an investigation into Congressman-elect George Santos. In a statement, Ann Donnelly, a Republican, writes, quote, The numerous fabrications and inconsistencies associated with Congressman-elect Santos are nothing short of stunning. No one is above the law, and if a crime was committed in this county, we will prosecute it. This comes after Tish James, the New York State Attorney General, already said she was looking into Santos. What is undoubtedly of interest to both is how Santos went from having no assets and a salary of $55,000 to being worth anywhere between $2.6 million to $11 million in the span of two years. I'm sure they would also like to know how he was able to loan his campaign more than $700,000. Congressman Alex Santos, we, we've given you a lot of time. I think the time that is owed is to the people of New York's third. Uh, it's hard to imagine how they could possibly trust your explanations when you're not really even willing to admit the depth of your deception. And the most important question is where did all the money come from? You know, as late as May of 2020, he reported a salary of $55,000. Then in 2021 and 2022, he reported earning somewhere between $3.5 and $11.5 million. That is an astronomical growth in his personal wealth that he has not sufficiently explained. As has been noted, he lent his campaign more than $700,000. He claims the money comes from the Devolder organization, which has been shrouded in secrecy. There's no public website. Uh, there's no LinkedIn page. It has been dissolved previously. Uh, and so where there's smoke, there's fire, and there needs to be both mm -hmm. a criminal and a civil investigation. Um, Robert, I'm going to end with you. Let's say George Santos, for one reason or another, either isn't seated or a new election is held. Would you run again? Well, I've already issued a, I already issued a declaration to George Santos, assuming his name is George Santos, that he should, in fact, because of his lies and the admissions of criminality, he should resign from his seat. And then I would face him head off in a, in a face off where I run against him. And the public could decide who's speaking the truth and who can best represent the district. So that's one offer I've made. And frankly, I want to, but I don't envision that happening. I think I don't want to make this about me. I quite frankly, Jonathan, want to keep the focus on George Santos, keep the focus on the urgency for the investigation, because that has to come first. We have to bring Democrats and Republicans together to get that done. When we have a vacancy, believe me, Jonathan, I'll be on the phone with you and discussing it. Let's not let Grisham off the hook. She never covered herself with any glory while she was press secretary. She's the first press, press secretary in the history of our nation that did not hold one press conference. She releases a memoir, which is supposedly an insider view to the Trump White House. And the title of that is, uh, I'll take your questions now. The title of a memoir for a press secretary who never held a press conference for the first time in our nation's history is, I'll take your questions now. And I don't want to make light of anybody's substance abuse issues. I know the president's working real hard to solve those throughout the country. But it's a little hard to believe that Burisma hired Hunter Biden to resolve their international disputes when he could not resolve his own dispute with Hertz rental car over leaving, leaving cocaine and a crack pipe in the car. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment. And I would say that uh, the pot calling the kettle black 
is not something that we should do. I don't know. I don't know what members, if any, have had any problems with substance abuse, been busted in uh, DUI. Uh, I don't know. But if I did, I wouldn't raise it uh, against uh, anyone on this committee. I don't think it's proper. Just when you think the GOP couldn't lack any more self-awareness, you have Matt Gates calling someone else out for a history of substance abuse. Now, for those of you who don't know... Baron, I don't know. I feel like I'm being a little bit of a Debbie Downer because, again, the urge is to make fun of them or mock them. But I feel like these are people who might be struggling with some stuff, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I agree 100 percent. But uh, you kind of don't really know, right? I mean, is there a problem with these people? Is it an act for some of them? I mean, are they just doing this because they think it's weird and fun? Is it? You can't really say it's a form of rebellion because these people, I think, are a little past the age for, for that kind of thing. But it is terrifying. No matter which way you slice it, this is terrifying because these are real people. These are people that show up and vote, and these are the things they at least claim to believe. Choose to believe that. You can believe that, but I have alternative news, and I find out differently. What do you think about this? How do you get through to a woman who can say, look at the Supreme Court. She has no idea what she's talking about. When he turns around and says, there's no indication that they've ruled anything, she's like, no, you just have to, you have to do the research. You have to go on Telegram or Rumble or something. What do you think? I, I just am confused as to how QAnon is even continuing now that Joe Biden is president. Because uh, I thought the whole purpose of what QAnon was espousing was that there were secret deep state forces who uh, were actually working on behalf of Trump and were never going to let this happen. And yet it has happened. Society has continued to uh, move along and none of that has come true. We, we just follow a lot of non mainstream media to learn the real truth about what happened. So, hey folks, we just had a disaster here with the airlines and holiday travel. Let's talk about how we got here. To understand where you are, you got to look at where you came from. So let's look back at what led to all this. Back when, before COVID hit, Trump appointed an airline executive by the name of Steve Dickinson to run the FAA. When COVID hit, being an airline executive, his first priorities were, you know, the, the profitability of airlines. And the, pro and the airlines were just losing a ton of money. You know, like everyone else, their business shut down. So what Steve Dickinson allowed the airlines to do was retire a ton of pilots. Industry after industry, we had the shipping industry, the oil and gas industry, just industry after industry after industry that had no government guidance at all. And the only cover that these executives have will be a government. You know, they like to claim they hate the government. But if the government keeps them in their job when things go bad. You know, if the government is forcing you to do something, you, your investors can't hold you accountable for it. The government has to be the bad guy for you sometime. At this point in time, our existence dictates that we have a healthy airline industry. Folks, this is our job. This is where we come into the system. We know for too long, people have sat back and said, well, this is not my job. Somebody else will take care of it. Something. And this is what we get when we have that attitude. No, our job is to run cover for the Biden administration as a people. To say, yes, the Biden administration is forcing the airlines to do what is necessary to get done so that we can have a long-term healthy industry that we all need. I'm Ben Micellis from the Micah's Touch Network. Donald Trump threw a humiliating New Year's party at Mar-a-Lago, if you even want to call it that. Donald Trump began by letting the media know that he would be available to answering questions, but no cable news network responded. Nobody showed up. The only people that were there were the radical right extremist kind of cult media that just follows him around like right side broadcast network. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He has no plans. And the only things that he does know how to do is actually harm and destroy our country. So he just says that we need to look into it strongly here. Let's play this clip of Donald Trump walking out on this red carpet. He thinks there's going to be a ton of media there, but there's absolutely not a single cable news network, no Fox, not even Newsmax or OAN. What's there? Here, play this clip. Here comes the president and first lady. Walk it up right now. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Hopefully it'll be a great year for everybody, including yourselves. And I hope you enjoy yourselves in Mar-a-Lago. And then inside the event, you have people like Rudy Giuliani doing uh, selfies of themselves here. This is, I'll show you this for a second. This is Rudy Giuliani at the event. <laughs> Then Donald Trump makes his entrance. And just as you're watching this entrance here, we'll play the clip. Just like, look how lonely and sad. You know, actually, you know, it would be sad if he wasn't a traitor, horrible human being. But like, it's just such a depressing mood in there. Here, play the clip. Yeah, just so utterly strange and bizarre. And then Donald Trump takes the stage and he starts uh, giving another speech. We're watching a war raging. We're watching nuclear weapons talked about all the time. We're watching inflation going through the roof. All of these things that we're watching and so unnecessary and so sad to see. 
Now we have airports where people can't fly. The only good thing is, frankly, from this standpoint, we needed some seats, so we lost about 50. We sold about 200 next time. So, uh, but it's good sad when people can't come from New York to Florida. And the airports are like, we're like a third world country. And of course, it wouldn't be a New Year's without Donald Trump posting some reprehensible thing on his social media platform. Just another xenophobic attempt to divide our country. I mean, saying horrible things about Mitch McConnell's wife who worked for him, who worked in his uh, administration. Again, attacking Republicans, calling them rhinos, because if you don't believe in the Donald Trump cult, if you don't go out to Mar-a-Lago and literally kiss the ring, then you are a rhino. If you don't support these despicable conspiracy theories, if you don't support... But whereas, you know, a real leaders would call for unity, bring the country together, spreading love, wishing people a happy new year. You have Donald Trump saying these things. I'm Ben Micellis from the Midas Touch Network. A federal judge in Washington, D.C. has just issued an order in a criminal case involving an insurrectionist where the judge ruled that Donald Trump's conduct on January 6th could be construed as making unlawful orders to the insurrectionist and citing the January 6th committee's final report as evidence of that. This is the first time we've now seen the impact of the January 6th committee's report in an order by a federal judge. So friends, don't you love it? When members of Donald Trump's inner circle inadvertently show their true traitorous colors. Let's talk about that because justice matters. In a text Hope Hicks sent on January 6th while the attack on the Capitol was underway, in that text, Hope Hicks hit the trifecta of despicability. In that short text exchange, Hope Hicks demonstrates, conveys, communicates three things clearly. First, Donald Trump is responsible for the attack on the Capitol. This is Donald Trump's insurrection. Two, Donald Trump's allies in the attack on the Capitol are who? The Proud Boys. Because Hope Hicks said, those are the only ones who will have us for future speaking engagements. The Proud Boys, a white supremacist nationalist group. And three, as the attack is ongoing, Hope Hicks doesn't express concern for the safety of the Capitol police officers who are being assaulted by Donald Trump's supporters. Hope Hicks doesn't express concern for the well-being of the legislators or the others who were inside the U.S. Capitol. She doesn't even express concern for Vice President Mike Pence, whom Trump's supporters were looking to hang. No, she expresses concern for her own future job prospects. And friends, doesn't that perfectly sum up what motivates, what drives Donald Trump and members of his inner circle, people like Hope Hicks, their own job prospects, how things impact them, how they can profit off the presidency. You know, they're like the anti-public servants. They're not there to serve the public. The public is there to serve them. But isn't it interesting that even Hope Hicks knew instantly and intuitively that Donald Trump and his corrupt cabal would be viewed as domestic terrorists. And she was right because this was Donald Trump's insurrection. Hope Hicks knew it. The January 6th committee knows it. We the people know it. And DOJ, if you're listening, accountability, because justice matters. Okay, Piers, I'm ready. The former president's in denial. I'll be completely straight with you. Face. I think I'm a very honest man, much more honest than you, actually. Really? Yeah. It was a free and fair election. You lost. Only a fool that they did. You think I'm a fool? I do now, yeah. With excuse me. Okay, with the legislature. The hard evidence. Excuse me. The most explosive interview of the year. I don't think you're real. This I'm, is not, I'm not very dishonest. Like, Let's finish up the interview. Morgan versus Trump. Turn the camera off. Very dishonest. <laughs> What the what? hell is going on? My favorite person in the world now is the person who cut that trailer because like you ain't doing him no favors, but stop zooming in farther. 